Well, today you'll hear from uh, David Kalish, the Australian statistician, Professor Sandra Harding, the chair of the Independent Assurance Panel, and Sue Taylor, the census director. And following the address from uh, each of our speakers today, there'll be an opportunity to schedule interviews with ABS spokesperson or representatives of the Independent Assurance Panel. And due to the volume of information released today and number of spokespeople, uh, we will not be taking uh, questions from the floor. Interviews can be scheduled via the ABS media offices and the independent panel media liaison located at the, uh, the back of the room. All right, uh, now time to welcome our first speaker today, Australia's statistician, uh, David Kalish. Thank you and welcome. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on today, the Ngunnawal people. I also acknowledge their continuing culture and contribution that they make to the life of this city and this region. I'd also like to welcome other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending today's event in person or via the live broadcast. It's a privilege to be here today at one of Australia's national icons, Old Parliament House the home of the Museum of Australian Democracy, as we release the data from the 2016 Census of Population and Housing, and return this vital information back to the Australian community. The Census of Population and Housing is one of the key pillars of Australia's democracy, providing us with valuable, authoritative information about our nation. So it's fitting to celebrate the release of the 2016 Census in such a historic venue. The results of the census are always eagerly anticipated. The data from the 2016 census provides invaluable insights into the makeup of our population and will be used to inform critical decisions that guide the future of our nation over coming years. The value of the census is what it shows about us collectively about our local communities and regions, our states and territories, our nation, and about how we are changing over time. Thanks to the overwhelming participation of Australians in last year's census and the perseverance and dedication of the ABS, I'm pleased to unveil the first round of 2016 census data. Reflecting the scale of our largest statistical collection, the ABS is today releasing 68.9 million pieces of data, 2.8 million tables of data, 30,000 detailed community profiles, and 80,000 quick stats. The census is the single and most valuable data set of our country and complements the other 500 statistical releases produced by the ABS each and every year. Today not only marks the release of the latest census data, but also updated estimate, estimated resident population. The census is a critical input into the estimated resident population, Australia's official population estimates. Using the 2016 census, together with other survey and administrative data, the latest ABS estimates show that as at 31 December 2016, Australia's population is now 24.4 million people. The 2016 census has once again shown the value that the Australian community places in the census and their support for the census. ABS estimates show that over 95% of Australia's occupied households completed the census with a net person undercount of 1%. The census shows Australia is more culturally diverse than ever before, with almost half of Australians either born overseas or with at least one parent born overseas. Australia is growing, particularly in our capital cities, where more than two thirds of Australians live. Sydney is still the largest city in Australia However, Melbourne is continuing to catch up. This year marked the 50th anniversary of the referendum that led to the full inclusion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the census. 
the proportion of the population reporting as having Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander origin increased to 2.8% in 2016, an increase of more than 18% in the last five years. Australians are also living longer, with one in every six of us over the age of 65. As you can see, there are so many insights from the 2016 census. I'll leave my colleague Sue to expand further on some of the stories from the census a little later. The 2016 census marked a new way of census taking in Australia. Over 63% of people completed the census online, with the Australian Capital Territory achieving the highest online response of all the states and territories at 81% of people. Not only does a digital first census make data faster and easier to process and produces a higher quality data set, it is also more efficient and consistent with citizens' expectations of dealing with government through accessible digital means. This has saved taxpayers over $100 million compared to the traditional census approach, money that can now be used for other worthwhile purposes. With nearly two thirds of us choosing the online form in the 2016 census, this approach will be continued for future censuses. Our special strategies to increase the coverage of specific populations also reaped significant benefits. These strategies were designed to ensure everyone could participate fully and easily in the census, including people with disabilities, people experiencing homelessness, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, as well as remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'd like to particularly highlight the higher online participation rate for some of Australia's multicultural communities. 90% of people born in China and 85.4% of people born in India truly embraced the digital census and completed it online. The addition of Norfolk Island to the Australian census for the first time added to the ABS's logistical challenge. However, the residents there embraced the census. Following the census collection phase and before releasing Australia's richest data set back to the nation, the ABS always undertakes extensive and rigorous data quality assurance work. I'd not like to acknowledge the committed staff of our data operations centre who processed 8.5 million household forms and 750,000 personal forms and undertook 23 million clerical operations and over 5 billion data transactions to translate individual and household returns into the statistics we are releasing today. In our secure facility, the data has been comprehensively reviewed and analysed for consistency between censuses in geographical areas. We also conducted the post-enumeration survey, a large sample survey of selected households to assess the completeness of census counts and identify potential improvements for future censuses. This survey is statistically independent from the census to ensure the evaluation is effective. This comprehensive range of checks has confirmed the quality of the census data. The ABS is accountable for delivering quality census data and that is what we have done yet again in Australia's 17th National Census. The 2016 Census data will inform important decisions by governments, by businesses, by communities and by households. In August 2016, I established an independent assurance panel with eminent Australian and international members to provide independent advice and assurance around the quality of the 2016 census data, alongside the ABS's existing quality assurance processes. I'd now like to invite the chair of the independent panel, Professor Sandra Harding, to speak about the findings of the independent assurance panel. Thank you.
Good morning. Uh, I also acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, uh, past and present. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I'll provide a few preliminary comments and then let you know the outcome of the Independent Assurance Panel's work. In August 2016, following Census Night, the Australian statistician made the decision to establish an independent assurance panel to review the quality of the 2016 census data. The specifics of the task set for the panel are contained in the panel's terms of reference and those are located at Appendix C in the report which has been released this morning. The panel was appointed in October 2016 and panel members do come with a wide range of experience and expertise. Panel members are Professor Lisa Jackson-Pulver, Pro Vice-Chancellor, Engagement in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Leadership, Western Sydney University, and member of the Australian Statistics Advisory Council. Professor Peter MacDonald, Head of Demography, Centre for Health Policy from the University of Melbourne. Peter Morrison, former Assistant Chief Canadian Statistician. Dennis Chewin, former Australian Statistician, all of whom are here today and Anton Voss, the Deputy Secretary of the Tasmanian Department of Treasury and Finance and member of the Australian Statistics Advisory Council, and myself, uh, Vice-Chancellor and President of James Cook University and former Chair of the Australian Statistics Advisory Council. The panel worked as a body independent of the Australian Bureau of Statistics to discharge our terms of reference. We met on eight occasions, in person, by video or teleconference, and with a great deal of our work being undertaken between meetings, with discussions occurring via email, and through a secure site provided for the purpose by the ABS. The timing of the panel's work has meant that our analyses have been undertaken and conclusions drawn about the quality of the 2016 census data at the national, state and territory level, but not for data at more detailed levels. And now to it. I'm pleased to let you know the outcome of our work. Based on our analyses, the panel has determined that the 2016 census data is of comparable quality to 2011 and 2006 census data and comparable to international benchmarks. Therefore, the panel has concluded that the 2016 census data is fit for purpose, it is useful and usable, and will support the same variety of uses as has been the case for previous censuses. In making our assessment, the panel used the results of the post-enumeration survey, a survey of 50,000 households undertaken independently of and immediately following the census to explore data quality. That survey provides a quality check on the 2016 census data. Consistent with the 2011 census, the post-enumeration survey pointed to a net undercount of persons on census forms. The 2016 result is a lower net undercount, a lower net undercount than the net undercount for 2011 and 2006. The net undercount is the difference between the undercount and the overcount. While the undercount is comparable to 2011, the post-enumeration survey revealed that some non-responding dwellings were incorrectly classified as occupied on census night, resulting in over-imputation or over-count. Another important check on quality involves comparing the census results with the estimated resident population, which is Australia's official population estimate. The estimated resident population is rebased using the census and then adjusted quarterly between censuses, taking account of births, deaths and migration. The expectation is that the new census data should be broadly in line with the 2016 unadjusted estimated resident population. The panel found that the 2016 census data aligns well with expectations and that these data can be used to rebase the estimated resident population. The panel also examined a number of key topics in the census, including population counts, sex, age, income, indigenous status, country of birth, language, ancestry and family structure. The panel found that the levels and distribution of characteristics matched expectations well and were comparable to other data sources where applicable. However, one change goes to an increase in the number of people citing no religion in the response to the religion question. 
Some of this change may have been caused by a change to the question format compared to previous censuses, or it may reflect a true broader societal change. The response rate for the 2016 census is lower than, but comparable to, that from the last two censuses, and is similar to response rates in other benchmark countries, specifically New Zealand, Canada and the UK. The lower response rate is partly due to the ABS overestimating occupied private dwellings on census night. The panel also made some observations on matters of interest. These are contained in the concluding section of our report, but today I want to comment on two issues that received a lot of media attention at the time of the census. First, on privacy concerns. Prior to census night, public concerns were raised about privacy. Impacts are apparent with more people reporting age rather than date of birth, as well as a large decline in the number of people agreeing to have their census form archived for 99 years. Further, while it is impossible to know whether some people provided valid names that were not their own, few names were withheld or clearly false names reported. While these outcomes have minimal impact on the accuracy of the census, incorrect names and lack of date of birth for some respondents can hinder data matching activities. With regard to the withdrawal of the online form on census night, we cannot be certain but withdrawal of the online form for 43 hours from census night may have resulted in more people using paper forms. This is unfortunate as online completions had somewhat higher response rates for individual census items. Apart from this, the withdrawal does not seem to have had any particular impact on public cooperation with the census. So to conclude with our, where I substantively began, Based on our analyses, the panel has determined that the quality of the 2016 census data is broadly in line with expectations and of comparable quality to the 2011 and 2006 census data and international benchmarks. Therefore, the Independent Assurance Panel, charged with examining the quality of the 2016 census data, has concluded that the 2016 census data is fit for purpose, it is useful, and usable and will support the same variety of uses as was the case for previous censuses. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, David, and thank you, Professor Harding. I'd now like to introduce Census Data Assurance Director Sue Taylor. Sue will present the results and key insights from the 2016 census, revealing who we are, what we do, how we live and where we're headed, as well as how you can access the latest census data. Sue. Well, it's a great pleasure today to be able to share with you some of the stories from the 2016 census about who we are and how we're changing. But before I begin, in this 50th anniversary year of the referendum, I would like to pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners on the land of which we meet, and their elders, both past and present. And I would also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today. So, what we've seen with the change in the counts over the last five years is that Australia is continuing to experience strong population growth. The 2016 census counted 23.4 million usual residents of Australia in Australia on the census night. That's an increase of 9% since 2011 and a doubling of Australia's population since 1966. The census doesn't count Australians who were overseas on census night. There were over 600,000 Australian usual residents overseas on census night, but these are included in our official population estimates, which have also been released today. So Australia's population is growing, but it's ageing too. 
In 2016, people aged 65 and over represent 16% of Australia's population. That's up from 14% just five years ago. And in Australia's oldest state, Tasmania, people aged 65 and over represent approximately 20% of the population. What's more, there are now more, nearly half a million Australians aged 85 and over. So there were 480,000 Australians, or 2.1% of the population, aged 85 and over in 2016. So, where do we live? Well, New South Wales is still the largest state with nearly seven and a half million people counted in the census on census night. And that's almost a third of Australia's population. Victoria is the next largest state with almost six million people. Almost 80% of Australia's population is concentrated in the three eastern mainland states and in the ACT. All of the states and territories have experienced growth since 2011. The fastest growing states, according to the census counts, are the ACT, Victoria and Western Australia. Each of those have grown by more than 10%. Tasmania and South Australia have grown by 3% and 5% respectively. So looking right across our wide brown land, the census tells us that two thirds of Australians live in the capital cities. This concentration, as well as the growth, is partly driven by international migration, with 86% of the migrants who've arrived in the past 25 years living in one of our capital cities. And since 2011, the capital cities have been growing at nearly twice the rate of the rest of Australia. So 10.5% as opposed to 5.7%. Our biggest capital city, Sydney, grew by 9.8% over the past five years. But Melbourne has eclipsed this, growing by 12.1%, and so it's catching up fast. They're not our fastest growing cities. Our fastest growing cities in 2016 were Darwin, 13.5%, closely followed by Perth with 12.4%. So the 2016 census has revealed that almost 650,000 Australians identified as being of Australian Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander origin in 2016. So this is an increase of 18% since 2011, and much of that growth has occurred in the eastern states, while the northern parts of Australia has seen lower growth. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population in New South Wales grew by 25% over that period, while for Queensland it was 20%. The Northern Territory has almost 3% growth. One third of Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population live in New South Wales and more than one quarter in Queensland. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people made up over one quarter of the population of the Northern Territory. So this is an age sex pyramid. And in the orange, the orange bars, you can see the age structure of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. It's a much younger age structure than the non-Indigenous population which is represented in the blue. So you can see those orange bars standing out at the bottom of the pyramid and they're representing the younger age groups. In 2016, more than half of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were aged under 25 years and that's compared to 31% of non-Indigenous people. If you look at the top of the pyramid where we see the older age groups, the difference is marked there too. The proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are aged 65 and over was just 5% compared to 16% for the non-Indigenous population. 
So our census is fantastic at telling us what a diverse nation we are. With over 180 countries of birth and over 300 different ancestries and languages. Nearly half of our population was either born overseas or had at least one parent born overseas. Australia has a higher proportion of first generation migrants than New Zealand, the UK, the US or Canada. The census shows us that two thirds of the Australian population were born in Australia. So England and New Zealand are still the most common countries of birth after of Australia. But the proportion of people born in China and India has seen a change since 2011. This next slide focuses on the recent arrivals, so the migrants who have arrived to live in Australia over the past 10 years. And if we look at those recent arrivals, you can see a bit of a difference in the ordering. You can see these are the top five countries of birth for, the, for that uh, group of people. This five countries here represent 50% of migrants to Australia over the past 10 years. And in fact, seven of the top 10 countries of birth for recent migrants are from Asia. This next slide here is another age pyramid. And what it's showing you is how diverse our overseas born population is. So the blue lines represent the European born and the orange lines on this graph represent the Asian born. The overseas born from Asia have a much younger age profile and a median age of 35 years. The largest cohort, the largest single age group for the Asia born is the 30 to 34 year age group. In contrast, people born in Europe had a median age of 55, 59 years with the largest age group 65 to 69. And this is because a lot of the European migrants came in many years ago and have aged in place with the rest of us. So where do migrants live? Well, over two million live in New South Wales, which has the largest overseas born population in Australia. That's 2.1 million people. But look over to the west. In Western Australia, nearly a third of the Western Australian population is born overseas. In both New South Wales and Victoria, the overseas born represent 28% of the population. So if we head down to the Apple Isle, you'll see the overseas born represent just 12% of the population there. So a really interesting uh, thing we're seeing this time is uh, having a look at religion. And what we've got here is a 50, a 25 year, and a 25 year look at religion. This is the changing face of religion in Australia across those 50 years. So if we look 50 years back in 1966, almost 90% of Australians reported a Christian religion. Less than 1% reported a religion other than Christianity, and less than 1% reported no religion. So if we fast forward to 2016, you'll see it's changed significantly. Just over half of Australians, 52%, reported a Christian religion in 2016. 8.2% reported a religion other than Christianity, and 30% reported no religion. In fact, in 2016, there were only two denominations uh, with well over a million responses. That was Catholics, then there were 5.3 million responses, and Anglicans, 3.1 million responses. For religions other than Christianity, Islam was reported by 2.6% of Australians, followed by Buddhism, 2.4%, and Hinduism, 1.9%. And if you look at this next graph, this will tell you that religion affiliation varies very much by age. So if we look at young adults there, so that's people aged 18 to 34, you can see that they're almost as likely to report not having a religion 
as having a Christian religion. What's more, they're more likely to be affiliated with a religion other than Christianity. If we look at the other end of the graph, at people aged 65 years and over, you'll see they're much more likely to report Christianity as a religion, so that's approximately 70% of those. And I'll just point out to you the religious pattern of those under 18 years of age is most similar to those aged 35 to 49, suggesting the form may be completed with their parents' beliefs. So moving on to what the census tells us about people's incomes. And of course, we collect incomes and disseminate it on a personal, family and household level. And this map here shows you median personal income across Australia and the states and territories. The median personal income for Australia in 2016 was $662 a week. The ACT has the highest median personal income in Australia at $998 per week, followed by two of our mining states and territories, the Northern Territory with 871 and Western Australia with 724. You'll note that South Australia and Tasmania have much lower median personal incomes than the other states and territories. But these are populations that are generally much older, with higher proportion of retirees in those populations. This slide tells you something about housing tenure over the past 25 years, so let's see what's changed. Well, in 2016, the most common type of housing tenure was for homes being bought with a mortgage, accounting for 35% of homes in 2016 compared to 28% in 1991. Homes that are owned outright account for 31% of homes in 2016, but 25 years ago, this was the most common type of dwelling tenure, with 41% of Australian homes owned outright. Rented homes seem to be more prevalent now in Australia, increasing from 27% of homes in 1991 to 31% in 2016. And of course, once you look at the state and territory level and down to the capital city balance of state level, you see even more variations than this. If we have a look at housing costs, this slide here represents the median monthly mortgage payments for the capital cities and for Australia in 2016. The median mortgage repayment for Australia was $1,755. Mortgage repayments were highest in Darwin, in Sydney and in Canberra. And in all of those, they were above $2,000 a month. This next slide in the green line shows the proportion of households in each state and territory paying more than 30% of their income on their mortgage and some indeed have called this um, mortgage stress. So Perth, Sydney and Melbourne have the highest proportion of households that spend more than 30% of their income on, on, on uh, their mortgage. And if you look at Perth, which is the highest at 9.3, that's telling us that almost one in 10 households in Perth spend over a third of their income on mortgage payments. Let's look at what's happening in the, the rental market. And again, this is for the capital cities and for Australia. And this is showing you median rent per week. So median rent for Australia is $335 a week. The capital cities in which median rent is highest is in Sydney, Darwin, Canberra and Perth. Sydney and Darwin are the only two capital cities where the median rent is more than $400 a week. This graph here shows the proportion of households in a capital city who are paying more than 30% of their income on their rent. And if you, you can see clearly here that Sydney is a standout. 14% of Sydney households are paying more than 30% of their income on rent. In Brisbane, it's 13%. 
So I'd like to thank you for your uh, attention and interest, and I hope you're as excited as we are about the information that we're getting out from the census today. I hope you've uh, enjoyed these stories from the 2016 census, and now I'll hand you back to our MC. Thank you. Sue, for outlining some of those uh, interesting stories from the, from the latest uh, census out today. And thank you to all of our speakers today. Thank you all for attending and showing your interest in the 2016 census data. That concludes our formal announcement for today. But uh, attending media, if you'd like to speak to an ABS spokesperson or representative of the Independent Assurance Panel, please speak to an ABS media officer uh, or the Independent Panel Media Liaison located at the, uh, the back of the room. If you have a technical inquiry about accessing 2016 census data or any of the census data products or services released today, please make your way through to our team of ABS data analysts in the members dining room number three through the door at the rear of the room. And data specialists are also located in this room and can clarify or answer questions about the data. Thanks very much for your attendance today.